Welcome to St. Ignatius Chapel. Today we celebrate Palm Sunday. Our celebrant today is Jesuit Father Russell Pollitt. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And welcome as we come together to celebrate Palm Sunday, the Passion of the Lord, or Passion Sunday. I welcome most especially those of you who join us on this broadcast. Now, it may have been difficult for you in these days to find palm branches in the lockdown. I invite you to take any greenery that you have and to hold that as we bless the palms this morning and then to make the responses with us so that you are part of what we are celebrating today. In these extraordinary circumstances, if you don't have palms, use any greenery that you can get at this time. And so, dear brothers and sisters, since the beginning of Lent until now, we have prepared our hearts by penance and charitable works. Today we gather together to herald with the whole Church the beginning of the celebration of our Lord's Paschal Mystery, that is to say, of His Passion and Resurrection. For it was to accomplish this mystery that He entered into His own city of Jerusalem. Therefore, with all faith and devotion, let us commemorate the Lord's entry into the city for our salvation, following in His footsteps, so that, being made by His grace partakers of the cross, we may have a share also in His resurrection and in His life. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, Sanctify these branches with your blessing and all branches that today people hold, that we who follow the Christ the King in exaltation may reach the eternal Jerusalem through him who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you. When they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their garments on them, and he sat thereon. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise 
praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, today we begin the most sacred and solemn week of our Christian calendar as we recount the events of that first Palm Sunday, Jesus entering into Jerusalem and the crowd cheering for him, Hosanna to the son of David. And we know that just in a few days, the world around Jesus will change and they will be shouting again, but this time, crucify him. There's an interesting little word in that account that I want to zoom in on today. It's in verse 5 of Matthew's account. It's the second line, the quote from the prophet Isaiah, using the word behold. Behold, the prophet says, your king is coming. What does it mean to behold at the beginning of this holy week? The word behold is in the scriptures perhaps like a chocolate. There is more than one layer. And as you begin to taste that chocolate and the flavor comes through, so you realize that beneath what you taste is another layer of chocolate, maybe even richer than the first layer. The gospel uses this word, behold, to teach us something. Over and over again in the scriptures, we hear the word behold. At the binding of Isaac in the book of Genesis, chapter 22, behold is seen. We hear it again at the burning bush where Moses beholds that God is at work. We hear John at the beginning of the gospel putting into the mouth of John the Baptist the word behold the Lamb of God. And in the Passion, on Good Friday, we hear Jesus saying, Behold your son, behold your mother, to the beloved disciple John. Now, in a number of our English translations of the scriptures, the word behold is often translated as see or look, but it doesn't quite capture the meaning of the word behold. Because to behold is not simply just to look or to see. It is to gaze upon, to perceive more deeply. To paraphrase it and to paraphrase a scripture scholar, it means to pay attention. Something very important is about to happen. And it's used more than a thousand times in the scriptures. And so I suggest that at the beginning of this Holy Week, we are being invited not simply to look or to see, but we are being invited to behold. And what does this beholding teach us? What does this beholding say to us? First of all, I think it asks us to look or to gaze contemplatively. We're being invited to gaze contemplatively to see with the eyes of the heart, as the great founder of monasticism in the West, Benedict of Nursia, wrote in his monastic rule. Beholding is not something we do with our eyes. It is something we do with our hearts. And this means we need to enter into a different kind of space in these days. And so I invite you in these days of Holy Week to put time aside for beholding. Turn off your phone. Read the Passion as it unfolds in the Gospels. Don't just simply see the words on the page like you would read a newspaper, but rather allow your heart to gaze at those words, to ponder them, to feel them. In these days of lockdown, wherever you may be, maybe after you have taken time to behold these words, gather with family or loved ones or friends and share the fruits of your gaze with each other. The second thing this word tells us is that those who see don't see. 
and those who behold see and are enlightened. Another lesson we learn is that behold is to really see. Those who see paradoxically don't necessarily see in the scriptures. In the story of Holy Week, few people see and understand who Jesus is. His disciples who have been with him at this time and all this time are blind. They run away because they do not behold. In stark contrast, the centurion after the death of Jesus beholds and announces, truly, this man was the Son of God. Beholding moves us from seeing to being enlightened by deeper truths. We see through the many facades that we create every day to the truth. It is a knowing that things are not really what they appear to be. It is the ability to pierce through the noise in our lives and perceive what is really important. It is our ability to grasp our salvation, to grasp what leads us to God. Can you allow yourself to behold in these days, to be enlightened to the real truth about yourself and others and our world, the truth that God is in control and that God loves each and every one, no matter who you are or where you come from, what you've done or what you have failed to do. And the third and final thing I want to suggest on this Palm Sunday is that our gazing is an invitation to conversion. Our gazing should invite us to conversion. As the account of Jesus' passion unfolds, it cannot but affect us now. Our beholding will no doubt help us understand more clearly how the dynamic of that story is also our story. Sometimes we, like the crowd, have fickle hearts. We too shout Hosanna one day and crucify him another day. We too find hypocrisy in our own hearts. And so we're invited to conversion. Like Judas too, we betray who we are when we are lured by material things, by wealth or by possessions, by status. We betray others. Sometimes we betray those we love. And so we're invited to conversion. Like the disciples, we too at times abandon our true identity when we run away like they did when Jesus was arrested. We abandon our identity as the beloved sons and daughters of God when we don't believe that we are loved by God beyond all else. We abandon our true identity when we don't make a Christian response to others, when we run away when the going gets tough and are afraid to face the plight of the poor, of migrants, victims of abuse and gender-based violence, victims of the societal structures we are all part of that abandons the most vulnerable. Our gazing invites us, friends, and our hearts to conversion. It invites us to look at the cross and the forgiveness that the cross bestows upon us. Don't be afraid in these holy days to hear the call to conversion. Don't be afraid to behold and to act on that gazing which leads us to a depth of life, perhaps, that we are not always familiar with us, familiar with. And so, what needs conversion in your own life as we begin these holy days?
Let us pray. Almighty, everlasting God, who as an example of humility for the human race to follow, caused our Savior to take flesh and submit to the cross, graciously grant that we may heed his lesson of patient suffering and so merit to share in his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with the word him that is weary. Morning by morning he wakens. He wakens my ear to hear those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I hid not my face from shame and spitting, for the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been confounded. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All who see me deride me. They curl their lips, they toss their heads. He trusted in the Lord, let him save him. Let him release him, for in him he delights. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For dogs have surrounded me. A band of the wicked besets me. They tear holes in my hands and my feet. I can count every one of my bones. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They divide my clothing among them. They cast lots for my robe. But you, O Lord, do not stay afar off. My strength, make haste to help me. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I will tell of your name to my kin and praise you in the midst of the assembly. You who fear the Lord, give him praise. All descendants of Jacob, give him glory. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking a form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Glory and praise to you, O Christ. Glory and praise to you, O Christ. Christ became obedient for us unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Glory and praise to you, O Christ. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. At that time, 
Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate, the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he made no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave them no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor wondered greatly. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much over him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the people to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this righteous man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe upon him. And plaiting a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spat upon him, and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, and put his own clothes on him, and led him away to crucify him. As they were marching out, they came upon a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. This man they compelled to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mingled with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there, and over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, Come down from the cross. So also the chief priests, with the scribes and the elders, mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, 
This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split and the tombs also were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Friends, let's now profess together our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of substantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit we incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I have confessed one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We have heard God's word and we've listened to an account of the Lord's passion. I'm going to invite you now to enter into just a moment of silence with us as we bring our own prayers, those that we want to make for ourselves and for those we love, but also at this time, prayers for our world before the Lord as we enter into this most sacred week. We bring before the Lord as well the many prayer requests that we have received electronically in these days, asking the Lord to grant them in His grace. And so, Lord our God, these are our prayers, the prayer that rests within the heart of each one of us, the prayer too that we have made electronically. We ask you to answer them in the time and the place that you know best, through Christ Jesus, your Son and our risen Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have this bread to offer fruit of the earth and work of our human hands, it will become for us the bread of life. This is be God forever.
Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of our human hands. It will become for us our spiritual drink. Let's pray, sisters and brothers, that our sacrifice and the sacrifice and efforts of all our lives may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the your hands for the praise and glory of God's name, for our good and the Lord of our Holy Church. Through the passion of your only begotten Son, O Lord, may our reconciliation with you be near at hand, so that, though we do not merit it by our own deeds, Yet by this sacrifice made once for all, we may feel already the effects of your mercy. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just. Our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For though innocent, he suffered willingly for sinners and accepted unjust condemnation to save the guilty. His death has washed away our sins and his resurrection has purchased our justification. And so with all the angels we praise you as in joyful celebration we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy. holy. Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread, and giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Save us, Saviour of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you've held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ we may be gathered into one by your Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, Bhutti, our Bishop, Duncan, his assistant, and all the clergy and all who minister to your people. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Saint Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, 
we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's join our prayer now with God's people all over the world as we pray the very words that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil, and graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who set your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Lamb of God, you take, take away, away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. My sisters, my brothers, behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sin of the world. How blessed are we who are called to share in this supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Although you cannot receive physical communion with us now, we invite you into a moment of spiritual communion. The great medieval theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas, defines spiritual communion as an ardent desire to receive Jesus in the Holy Sacrament and a loving embrace as though we had already received him. His words are echoed by the great mystic and fellow doctor of the church, St. Teresa of Avila, who wrote, When you do not receive communion and do not attend Mass, you can make a spiritual communion, which is a most beneficial practice. By it, the love of God will be greatly impressed on you. At this moment, we invite you to focus on Christ and your longing for union with Him. Express your desire to feel His grace coursing through you, giving you strength and courage, particularly in these difficult times. In your desiring union, you are united with us and to Christ. In this moment, we experience the reality that is already here.
Father, if this chalice cannot pass without my drinking it, your will be done. Let us pray. Nourished with these sacred gifts, we humbly beseech you, O Lord, that just as through the death of your Son you have brought us to hope for what we believe, so by his resurrection you may lead us to where you call. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. Look, we pray, O Lord, on this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ did not hesitate to be delivered into the hands of the wicked and submit to the agony of the cross, who lives and reigns for ever and ever. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go now in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God.